comfortable. And of course, the Lord gave her three thousand dollars instead of two. And we were just rejoicing about what God is doing and how he's paying that bill every semester. And that's the way it is for you and I. Every step of the way is step by step. Right. Sometimes we can't see the future. We don't know what God has in store. But if we trust him step by step, he'll never lead us down the wrong path. Amen. And so all we do is just stay focused on Jesus. Amen. Focus on Jesus. And so she was just sharing about the ministry there. Last summer, she went to Miami uh, to minister to the Jews there. And so it's going to be exciting to hear uh, if there's a difference between uh, the Jews in New Jersey and the ones in Miami. So uh, but the bottom line, we know they all need Jesus. Amen. And that's what it comes down to. Well, it was encouraging. It's encouraging. You ever stop and ask yourself not not only why would God use me, but how does he use me? I was thinking about that yesterday. How does God even use me? <laughs> you know? That's amazing what God can do if we just surrender to him, right? And so God is so faithful. Let's go ahead and look at uh, Genesis 24 again, and we'll continue what we left off last week. We want to look at some areas of uh, actually more of a practical uh, study this morning as we continue from last week. And I want to give you the first three points. We'll be on point number four this morning uh, in case some of you were missing. But the, the first thing we saw here in the story, we, as we look at it as a practical standpoint for for our own marriages as, as couples and as well as our, our children, our, their future marriage as well, we see a lot of lessons that we get here. There's nine I want to give to you uh, specifically. We covered three. These last six will go a little faster. Uh, but the first thing we looked at was the fact that Abraham, before he died, he had a burden in his heart that he wanted to see his son Isaac married. You know, uh, you know a man needs a good woman. Amen. I don't know what I would do if it wasn't for my wife. I was uh, sick last week and she she filled in for me, and then this weekend I had a bunch of work I had to do, and she filled in for me. And uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, I, the, the longer I stay married to this, this woman of mine, uh, the more I realize how much I love her. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We won't get mushy right now, amen? But the first point I, I made out was that marriages must only be in the Lord. And we can't take anything for granted in this day and age. You know, you look at this and say, well... Yeah, we get that. We know that. We're, we're saved. We've been saved quite a while. We get that. You can't take anything for granted today. You really can't. And so we talked about that, how all measures must be in the Lord, that most must, must, both must be uh, saved and uh, in right standing with the Lord. The second thing that we looked at was that marriages must have God in the center of their relationship by including uh, godly influences, God, godly leadership. Uh, you know, the Bible says we, in the multitude of councils, there is safety. Amen. And that we should be involved as parents or parent figures and pastoral staff should be involved in the lives of our young people when it comes to interest in opposite sex. And we start from day one. Uh, the Bible says when they rise up, when they go about their way, when they lie down, right? We, we have those scriptures before them. You know, oftentimes parents will put that thing off and they'll say, well, I think it's about time to have that talk. And by then it's already too late. They already know everything and they've learned it from the wrong source. It's a day by day thing that we have to guide our children in these areas and show them the importance of what God's will is and the priorities they should have in their life as they're growing up. You know, I look at my children and my daughter will be a teenager this year. And I'm thinking uh, she still in some ways she has a lot of maturity to her. In other ways, she acts just like a little kid. And when I see that little kid come at her, that, I love that. I want her to be a kid as long as she can. Amen. I want her to enjoy that, that purity and that. And that the good life that God, the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. And so we saw that. And so parents need to be involved. And uh, we talked about that there and how uh, Abraham was involved in his son's life. Uh, if you don't have that, that mother or father figure, uh, sometimes it's extenuating circumstances. Sometimes it's a single mother and she's trying to fill the role of a mother and a father. You may have an uncle or whoever it might be or your pastor uh, can fill into that role. But we need to seek some type of counsel from godly people in this area. And so that's important that we do that uh, for our children. Uh, the third thing we saw was that uh, we saw that when you marry also, when we talk about this thing, that uh, you, you marry into the family. You know, many of y'all experienced this already. When you go visit the in-laws, uh, that's now your family by law, right? And we have to get along, hopefully, and, and, and get to know one another, and that's a big part of that. And so we talked about how modern-day dating, we use the example of Samson, how Samson uh, was a great example and picture of modern day dating. You saw that picture there and what, how his life was destroyed uh, through that. And so we make that very clear. The second thing we need to be careful about is that we pray for our children's future spouse. Uh, and if you're a single person, you're older, you pray for your own spouse as well. Right now you start doing that. When I got saved, one of the first things I did was I started praying for a godly wife. And the uh, Lord led me to one, fortunately. And so we talked about that in uh, Genesis 24 and 12. We saw how the servant who represents the Holy Spirit prayed on behalf of Isaac and how the Holy Spirit also prays and makes intercession for us today. 
And then thirdly, we talked about how marriages must involve those. And we gave some characteristics of the, of the type of person we should seek. And, and if you're already married, it should be the type of person that you desire to be or, or that you are. Amen. Or you're becoming. Uh, we talked about how we should care for our health. Uh, in Genesis 24, 16, the damsel was very fair to look upon how she kept herself uh, fit. And I think we should do that. We should eat right. We should exercise. We should want our, even though our body is just a vessel, it's, it's, the Bible says bodily exercise profits little. We've got to keep it in good shape because it's what we use to serve the Lord. Amen. And so I'm always reading up on health article, articles and things of that nature. Trying to, uh, lately, I've been trying to figure out how to lose weight. I've gained about 25 pounds in like two months. And I just can't get it off. Well, I know why I can't get it off, but I got to figure this thing out. So, you know, it's kind of funny. You're fighting with this losing weight thing. and You're trying to figure you don't want to buy new clothes for me. I have to order my clothes. I definitely don't want to buy new clothes. But you're trying to figure out this balance between being happy and being healthy. And that's a tough balance. Hey, man, <laughs> I mean, I know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's hard to be happy and healthy. You want to eat this and eat that. But then your, your diet says you can't. Hey, man, it's a struggle. Let me tell you. And so anyway, especially when you had to, had to deal with it your whole life, you were an athlete, and then now I'm a has-been, and so it's a struggle. So I'll need your advice. If you can help me out, you can pull me aside today and give me some advice. Uh, the second thing we saw, a characteristic you want to have, is you want to have high morals. Uh, you know, I was talking to Marlon today, and she's, when I'm talking to her, it's, it's amazing. When I, I love talking to our young people who've gone on and served the Lord, and then they begin to teach you things. Amen. I love learning things from my kids. I love learning things from young people. You know why? First of all, I get to learn something, and that's exciting. But I know they're learning as well. And that's why I get so excited. And she was talking about biblical separation and how, uh, you know, we're not a holier than now when we want to abstain from things. Abstaining from things doesn't keep you holy. It's just a method by which we stay holy. Amen. That's a good way to look at it. And so she was telling me what she's been learning. That was very, very good practical uh, stuff there. But here we want to make sure that we marry someone who has high moral character. That's someone who loves the Lord. And it says here, a virgin, neither had any, any man known her. And we talked about significance of the father walking the bride down the aisle and while we wore uh, a white dress on that day. And then thirdly, somebody who's hardworking. And we saw how Rebecca hasted. She, 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 she was a servant at heart and she was, couldn't wait to wait on this servant. She had no idea who he was, which really shows her character because he didn't have to be anybody important. Sometimes we do things for people who are significant or important that we might get something in return. But the Bible teaches Christian character that you do, though, even for your enemies. Amen. She had no idea who this man was, but yet she treated him like he was family. And so that's what we want to see uh, in our spouses and those who we look for our kids to marry. And the Bible says she went and drew for all the camels until they had done drinking. And we knew that was probably it took hours and hours. And then we talked about hospitality, hospitality and how she, the Bible says we have both straw, she said, and provender enough to, and room to lodge. She made uh, that servant feel at home and how we have to have a spouse that is caring and loving and hospitable and so forth. Now, if you're born in Alabama and Georgia, you have no choice but to be hospitable. Amen. If you don't, you stick out. Amen. Uh, we get old southern folks there. And so we see that there. And then fourthly, we'll continue today. We're going to see fourth principle we see is that marriages should not be forced. Now, a lot of people read this passage and they'll misinterpret and say, well, this is a prearranged marriage or this is a forced marriage. But look at Genesis 24 and verse 58. Here we see the Bible makes it very clear that this was not a prearranged or necessarily forced marriage or not even really a prearranged marriage because she had a choice. Amen. It says in Genesis 24, verse 58, it says, and they called Rebecca and said unto her, this is after they heard all that the servant had to say. So the parents were involved. They heard who this man was and what he was about. They knew what, where she was going, so to speak. They knew who she was going to marry. So they were informed parents. They were involved parents, even on her side. But then when they, when they realized that this might be the will of God, they let her make the final decision after she was informed. And it says here in verse 58, And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. The power of the woman is that you have power from the beginning and you have the power all throughout the marriage. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, the woman can always say yes or no. But with that great responsibility or great, uh, yeah, responsibility comes, a, a, well, with that great, how can I say this? With the ability to have that choice that God has given you comes a great responsibility. Does that make sense? When you say yes, you got to know what you're saying yes to. And it's a commitment for life. It's a serious decision. As a matter of fact, I would go as far as to say that marriage is the second most important decision next to salvation in life. It really is. We don't have time to go into all that and delve into all that, but it really is. And so she was able to answer yes or no. So this is not a forced marriage. 
It was not really prearranged because prearranged means you're going to marry the person I tell you to marry. It wasn't that. We see both the daughter was involved and the parents were involved as well. The fifth thing we see is that marriages must be commended to the Lord. Look at Genesis 24 and verse, six, and verse 60. We see that because parents are to be a vital role in the, in the area of marrying their children, uh, that they are to be a, a picture of God until kids are old enough to understand who God is, that we need to be there along, all along the step of the way. In other words, parents know their children better than anybody else outside of God. We've had a chance to assess them. We know when they're probably ready to be married. You see, age is nothing but a number. You can be 21 and still have the mentality of a 13-year-old. Amen? Each one of your children are going to be different, and it's your role as a parent to know uh, when they're ready for this, this step in their life. Some, some people I've seen get married as young as, you know, 19 or 20 or 21 uh, that were very mature, who had been raised that way, who were always helpful at home, uh, were hard workers, were uh, always worked hard in areas they struggled. They had already showed that fortitude and that character of Understand the importance of their role in marriage. They were able to transition into that marriage seamlessly because they had been raised that way and had that kind of spirit and just was mature at early age. And we see that sometimes. Very rare, but we do see that today. And so it's up to you as a parent to help your children understand uh, when that time is. Amen? And uh, I know I went to a previous church where the pastor would not marry anybody under the age of 20 because 20 is the age that's mentioned in the book of Genesis or in the Old Testament quite a bit when it, when it talks about going out to war and things like that. Uh, but everybody has a different view of how they see that. But that's that's the overall view of this. And so we see in verse 60 that it says, and they so she had her family's blessing. It says, and they bless Rebecca and said unto her, thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions and let thy seed possess the gates of those which hate them. And so they understood who she was marrying. They understood what life is going to entail for her because she was marrying the successor of Abraham, who was Isaac. They knew what God had called Isaac to do. He was the father of all nations. And so she, they knew her role was going to be significant and vital, and she had their blessing. Amen? And so we see that here. And so it's vital that our young people, that the, I tell our children all the time, it's important that when you get married that you receive mom and dad's blessing. When I married my wife, uh, her parents weren't here. The church was actually willing to fly her parents over, but unfortunately we couldn't because there was too much turmoil in her country, uh, which I thought was a nice gesture. Uh, and so... Uh, I had to actually uh, email her dad and ask for her hand in marriage. And uh, I talked to my wife about that. Her parents went around. Uh, I spoke to my parents about the whole thing. And, and, and so we did it that way. So there's ways to work around that. But that's what I did and, and got her dad's blessing. He had never met me before, so it was a little peculiar. But we got to do what we got to do, amen. But I still want to do the right thing, even though I was an old man already, amen. So God is good. Uh, number six. Marriages involves patience in God bringing the right one into our lives. I had a conversation a couple months ago. I'm not going to tell you who it was. Uh, with one of our, our, our former young people, she's a young, young adult now, and uh, this person is married. You, you think you might know who it is, but I'm still not going to tell you because you, you probably don't know who it is. Anyway, I was having a conversation. She says, Pastor Will, I don't know why I was in such a rush to get married. Now, before you... You know, get a little riled up here. She wasn't saying she wasn't happy to be married. She was just saying, I don't know why I was in such a rush to get married. OK. And so we got to understand that this marriage thing is something that takes patience and making sure that we're waiting on the Lord in this thing, too, as well. Amen. Uh, and so look at Genesis 25 and verse 20. Here we see the chapter later being referred to here. But it says here it just gives a little insight to Isaac's life after chapter 24. It says, and Isaac was 40 years old. Uh, when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. It just goes on to re reiterate how old he was and saying that uh, 40 years old is at the time he got married. Now, you may say that's pretty old for today's standard. It, it really is. I would agree with you. But I have several friends who got married in their 40s. And some of them married uh, young ladies who were in their late 20s or early 30s. Nothing wrong with that. But that's the, the timing that God had for them. Let me give you a picture. Genesis 2, verse 18. Let's go ahead and look at what happened in the very beginning. Uh, who officiated the first marriage, by the way? It was God, amen? It was God. L look at the description of this, this marriage ceremony. In Genesis 2, look at verse 18. You could actually use this in a marriage ceremony if you want to, wanted to as a preacher. But it says here, and the Lord God said. Now, let's go ahead and look at some of the principles of marriage and why God intended it. It says, it is not good. That man should be alone. How many of y'all say amen to that, man? Amen. I will make him a helpmeet 
for him. So she used to be a completer, not a competer. A lot of times in marriage, we see compete competition. It says, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them into Adam. Now, look what it says here to see what he would call them. And so it's like God was showing him the order of creation. First of all, we get to enjoy all the beauty of creation that God has made. But as Adam was naming these creatures, you can imagine as he was naming them, he was a very intelligent man, by the way. If you, if you had to name all that exists today, you had to be pretty intelligent. And as he was naming these creatures, he saw them coming and he saw that they had some type of mate. There was both male and female. And then he looked at the human race, which is all but himself, and probably thought to himself, where's mine? I wonder if that was what he was thinking. But it says here that to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her into the man. And, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they both were naked and the man and his wife were not ashamed. And so what we see here is a whole lot of things. We see, first of all, we see, again, patience, right? I mean, Adam had to wait quite a while. I'm sure it took a while to name all these creatures. And I can imagine what it was like when he woke up from that deep sleep. I pray that when we get to heaven that we can watch this movie, amen? And when he saw her, I'm sure his, his jaw hit the ground, amen? And he went bonkers, amen? But God knew exactly what he needed. And that's the same for you and I, man. When he sent us our wives, he knew exactly what we needed, Amen? Uh, it may not seem that way when you're first married. There are some things that got to get worked out. You got two, right? You got the uh, opposite sex, opposite in the way they think, opposite in nature. They have to come together to become one. I can tell you, when, and, and my wife will tell you the same thing. We thought we had made a mistake in the beginning because we began to discover things about each other that we didn't know. Wow. It really is true. You can actually even uh, get to know somebody a little bit better before you get married and still find out different things after you get married. And that's what we're going to talk about a little later, about what true love really is and how it's so different than what we see in the world today. Amen. And we're going to see that this morning. But as we look at this story, we see that God officiated the first marriage and it involves patience. And then Paul, just like Adam had to wait for God to bring along that right one, uh, we have to do the same when it comes to our children. Amen. We have to make sure we find that right one because it is a very important decision. Now, for Adam, it was it was hard in the area probably of waiting and having patience. But it was easy in that there was only one that he had, to, well, that God chose for him. Amen. And so I believe God works the same way today. I don't believe it's any different. You see, our focus right now for our young people should be on growth and development. It really should. Uh, I always say this, a single life is a what? A serving life. You say, well, why is that? Because we're learning how to be married. Everything that we're doing, everything your children learn at home, you're preparing them to leave home. You're preparing them to have a successful marriage. And when you allow them to go out on, on dating different guys, you're teaching them how to break up. You're teaching them how to divorce. You have to be involved in this thing. And as we draw close to the Lord, as these young people draw close to the Lord, and as their future mate draw close to the Lord, they'll have a better idea what God's will is for their life. And when you know exactly what God wants you to do and what he's calling you to, then he's calling your mate to the exact same thing. Amen. And it all comes together. So as they're growing closer to the Lord, they got their eyes on the Lord and they're serving the Lord and focusing on, on, on what is important to the Lord. Then God is doing the same thing with their mate over here. And he's got that one for them. And somehow he brings them together in one place. I don't know how he does it, but he does that. And so the Bible says, delight thyself also in the Lord. He will give thee the desires of what? Of thine heart. When I got saved, I was in my early 20s. I didn't get married until my late 20s, almost 30 and I had already surrendered to preach. I had already surrendered to ministry. Uh, I was actively working in bus ministry and children's church and things of that nature. Uh, I was actively involved in campus outreach during that time. And as I was doing that, obviously, I was praying and looking for a wife. But I found that the closer I got to the Lord in my walk, the more apparent the type of wife that God wanted me to have came to me. It, it was a, like a vision. Like God showed me exactly what he wanted me to have. So even if I had preacher friends who had daughters... 
And they would say, hey, why don't you meet my daughter? I would talk to them, and I would not automatically assume that because they were a pastor's daughter, that they were going to be my wife. Because why? As I was growing close to the Lord, God was giving me discernment. Amen? Uh, it's not enough that they be saved, but they must be surrendered. They must love the Lord. Paul talks about that in Corinthians. Amen? And so it's important that we get that. And so that was very clear to me that, that you, you, you want them to be actively involved because if your children are actively involved in ministry and actively involved in their church and, and they're being faithful to the Lord, then you, that's less you have to worry about when it comes to them choosing their mate. You see, when, when several young ladies found out that I was a preacher, they were no longer interested in me. I said amen to that. That's one less decision I have to make, amen? They didn't want to be married to a pastor. They didn't want to be married to somebody in ministry. You see what I'm saying? So you narrow down the possibilities there. And so it's so important that our children be dedicated to the Lord. And it's important that they know what God's will is for their life before they enter into this, this thing called marriage. Number seven, marriage involves the respect of the wife. It, it involves the respect of the wife. Look at Genesis 24, uh, verse 62. Rebecca was respectful, we see here, to, toward her husband. In Genesis 24, in verses 62 through 65, it says, And Isaac came from the way of the well, Lahora, for he dwelt in the south country, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. You can imagine his anticipation here. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes. Man, you can always see this in the movie, right? As they both lifted their eyes toward one another. I can picture this. And when she saw Isaac, look what the Bible says here. She lighted off the camel. Now, in the original Hebrew, this, this phrase, lighted off the camel, means to cast self down. It is a picture of subjection. She made the first move in coming in and being in subjection to him. It says, for she had said unto the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant has said, it is my master, therefore... She took a veil and covered herself. So we see subjection. We see respect. We see reverence. But we also see modesty and humility in her characteristics here. Isn't that amazing what we see here? We see from the very beginning she understood what her role would be as a future wife to her husband. And we see those characteristics shine here. Uh, it is very true that if a husband treats his wife like a queen, she would treat him like a king. It really is true. But it starts with respect, that sometimes it's hard to respect honorary men, women, I, I, wives, I get that, amen. Uh, sometimes it's hard to respect someone who may not, you may not think they're doing things the way you think they ought to do it, or whatever the case may be. But the Bible teaches that if we respect them for just because they're our husbands, just like we teach our children, respect your parents because they are your what? Your parents. It's really that simple, and we just trust the Lord. We do the same thing in our homes. If wives, we respect our husbands, even though they're not perfect, just because they're our husband. And we honor them that way, then God will bless us in return. Because God is the one who's going to do the changing. You can't change him. Only God can. Amen. And our children need to learn at a young age. Sometimes our young ladies grow up in a home where the father's maybe not present or he's not being the dad he ought to be. And they have to learn to honor that dad. They're still, and they're, what are they learning there? They're learning to honor their husbands in the future. It's a hard life sometimes, but God will bless that. He will show them the right way. He will build character in them through that. And so we see that principle here. And so... Wives, we have to respect our husbands. They are, they are, you're married to them for life. Uh, they're your, the, the only one that you have, amen? Uh, you're, you've become one. And so you have to honor them and respect them. This, in 1 Peter 3, look at verse 4 through 6, it says here, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God a great price. And that's really what matters is, what does God think of my life? What does God think of my behavior as a, as a wife? Is what I'm doing pleasing to him? And so when you, when you find it hard for you to be respectful towards your husband or reverent towards your husband, then take your eyes off him and put them on the Lord. Amen? And God will honor your actions. He really will. He will reward it. He will make the changes that need to be made in his time. But sometimes we forget that there's changes that we need to make ourselves. Sometimes God is using even our spouses to bring change in us that we need. I found that when I got married, I found out how selfish I really was. I says, man, I'm selfish. I need to change. 
And then my wife will let me know that too. <laughs> Amen. And marriage has changed my life. It really has. It's, it's, built, it's brought character out of me because now two are trying to live as cheap as one. Amen. And trying to uh, get along in the same house uh, 24-7. It, it will change you. You either change or it's not going to work out. Amen. It's a humbling experience. Marriage is a big deal. It's a big responsibility. It says here, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do, do well and are not afraid with any amazement. We see a couple things here. First of all, we see that one of the greatest examples in all the Bible is our father of faith was Abraham. God used Abraham and Sarah and said if they, being as significant as they are in our Christian heritage and, he, and history, if they followed this pattern, then who are we not to follow this pattern? Amen? He used them as an example. But I like this, this small uh, caveat I see here. It says, being in subjections, it says here, unto what? Their own husbands. You know what I found as a counselor? That when a woman begins to take her problems to another man outside the marriage, it's never a good experience. It never ends well. Amen? And that's all I'm going to say about that. The eighth thing we see is that marriage involves not only the respect of a wife toward her husband, but marriage involves the love of the husband toward his wife. Here we see that Isaac loved his wife. In Genesis 24, verse 67... It says, and Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. They truly became one flesh. But look at the order here that we see. It says she became his wife, and then he what? He loved her. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And what that really means. But in Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We know in the Old Testament, it says, Greater love hath no man in this, that he would lay down his life for his friend. The greatest pinnacle of love that you can display is that you will be willing to give your life for the one whom you love. That includes our spiritual lives when it comes to serving God. We should love him more than anybody. But it also entails our wives. We should be able to give our physical lives for our wife. Amen. That's really what it means. And so men that love and honor their mothers in a godly manner tend to also love and honor their wives. And we raise our boys to love their mothers and to respect their mothers so they make a great husband one day. And when men love their wives, the wives usually reciprocate. And so what I'm saying is if we treat her like a queen, she'll automatically treat us like a king. If we make her feel like she's the most important thing in our life, then she will reciprocate. That's how God created the wife to be. To respond to that type of treatment. When we love them, they, God created them to automatically respond to that nurturing and love that we give them. J. Vernon McGee said this. Do not tell me that a wife has to love her husband. God does not say that. God says that she is to respond to him. Wow. If he says to her, I love you, then she is going to say right back to him, I love you. Y'all want to practice that right now? No, I'm just kidding. I just want to see what would happen here. <laughs> if this is true. No, I'm just kidding. I know it's true. When a man tells me my wife is very cold, that is a dread giveaway that he is not really the kind of husband he should be. If he is the right kind of husband, she will respond because he is the one to take the lead. And so when it's all said and done, it goes back to the, the husband. We're the leaders of the home. It starts with us. It really does. We set the tone. I know in my household, I'm the one to try to make light of things, you know. When I come home from work, I want to be the one to, to, to bring out the laughter and the joy in the house and get everybody excited and things of that nature. And uh, the kids can't jump on my back anymore because my back hurts, but uh, we do other things, hey, amen. We keep it going. So, all right, last scene number nine. Marriages must not be based on, on love. Now, did I put it up there? Yeah, in parentheses, lust. I'm talking about the type of love that we see in the world today. How many of y'all say amen to that? Genuine Bible love is learned and grows as the years come. It's really true. If you thought you loved your wife in the very beginning, if you've been married for any length of time, if you've worked out some details of the problems you've had in your marriage, and you, you can look at that woman and say, I love you still, you're going to find that you'll fall in love with her all over again. Because why? She, she, she has stick to In other words, she's not going anywhere. She's made that clear to you. 
You've made that clear to her that you're going to be with her to the end, that you're sticking by your vows. And again, that starts with the man. You say, what do you mean? Again, when we treat our wives, not, you know, see, we, we can't. And I learned this. I had to learn this the hard way a long time ago. Uh, I cannot give her flowers on, on Saturday and expect for that to last for the next two years. Because that's not the way they, they work. Their minds work. You know, they remember everything. The good things and, unfortunately, the bad things, too. <laughs> and it's something that we have to do on a daily basis. And it took me a couple years to get that. I, I knew it was in the Bible, but, you know, I had to learn it the hard way, right? But those are things that we learn over time, that, it, that if, if, we, if we go to our wife thinking that I don't love you anymore, it's not her fault. It's your fault. If you go back to doing the things you did in the very beginning, she'll respond to that, and it'll be just like in the beginning. It's because we as men stop doing what we should do towards our wives that things change. It's not them, it's us. Because marriage is boldly and clearly presented in the Bible as a lifelong commitment, it is obviously is a union that should not be entered into on the basis of romantic sentiment, careless thinking, and careless desires. You say, what do you mean? Well, if you look at Hollywood today, everything is about romance. There should be romance in a relationship but that should not be the primary thing because the way you look when you got married is not the way you're going to look later and not the way they're going to look later. So if it's based on that, it's not going to last. Amen. And sometimes we men forget that if we have a problem with the way our wives look, which they always are beautiful from the inside out, of course, uh, then we've forgotten to look in the mirror ourselves. We don't look the same either. Amen. That's the way it is. And so it has to be more than just a lust. It has to be true, genuine love, Christ-like love. Christ loved us when we were unlovable. Amen. And we have to love each other the same way. You see, love is a lousy basis for marriage. Proverbs 31, 30 says, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And if we have wives that fear the Lord, that should be our greatest desire. That is, that is rarer than a ruby, the Bible says. Amen. That's because you're not going to find that anywhere else. It's very rare. And so we should cherish that. In other words, we should take that ruby and, and polish it and make it shine and say, well, how do you do that? By loving your wife, by loving your wife. See, love is learned primarily after marriage. The Bible says he knew his wife and then he loved her. You see, Isaac and Rebecca before this had never met or even had an opportunity to fall in love prior to their marriage. They simply trusted the providence of God and the wise counsel of their respective families. They trusted their, their parents. They trusted uh, the Lord in all this. And when they got together, they followed God's precepts and they loved each other. She became his wife and he loved her. Isaac loved Rebecca after they were married. It doesn't mention anything about romanticism before the marriage. Love is something that comes over time and, and it grows over time. Once we've gotten to know all the flaws of each other and the negative characteristics and we still love them anyway and we work through those things, that's when we realize we have something. Marriage is what you make it. Amen? All right, next slide here. All right. We see that it is rare, if not non existence, that young persons who are wholly and completely prepared to consider this vital decision of marriage, free from fleshly romance and desires, we don't see that today anymore. The priority is given to, to the romantic side of the marriage instead of the spiritual aspect. And so the question that we should be asking about our own children even is, what do you look for in a, in a spouse? Do you look for the spiritual aspect? Is that most important? Or is it the physical attributes? You say, well, you have to be attracted. Well, yeah, I agree with that to some extent. But the spiritual aspect is most important. Today we see flirt to convert. You say, what does that mean? Well, we, we see our young people dating someone who is not married or saved in hopes that they might get saved and they may get married. That right there should tell you something that what are they attracted to them by? Automatically, it's got to be the fleshly thing because they're not even saved. Amen? And so we've got to be careful with that. Evangelism dating, some call it. See, Hollywood movies and magazines and most of our society would have us to believe good marriages are based on modern romance. You see, decades of disastrous divorce statistics made up from the shattering homes because they're based on the philosophy of Hollywood. We see it all the time. We're already practicing on how to divorce before we even get married. In closing, I want to give you one last scripture that Paul gives to the church at Thessalonica. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. We find here that there was a city here called Thessalonica who was pagan worships, worshipers, to say the least. And it was not uncommon to walk through the city of Thessalonica and see 
statues all about the city. And to many of them, they had transcribed unto the unknown God. They were worshiped false idols. And then here Paul comes along and many of them get converted. And he starts a church there. And he began one of the main principles he preached on was eschatology. He taught him many different principles in the Bible. But one was eschatology when he talked about the return of Christ, the rapture. And there is where he used the term the blessed hope. And so what he was doing was he was trying to encourage the people there to live for God by sharing with them that they have a blessed hope, Jesus Christ, who will one day return for them. And so he was using that as an encouragement to them. But he found among these folks, there was a lot of sensuality going on here. There was a double standard where the wife was supposed to stay at home and be faithful while the man went out and did whatever he wanted to do. There was all types of things going on in the church there. But let's go ahead and look at five verses here. and We'll close. But I want to give you something here that we can use in our lives when it comes to helping our children in the area of marriage and maybe in our own marriage as well. But look at verse three. Here we find that Paul says here in verse three, he says, for this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. And so we see positional here. In other words, we see a place of position where uh, when we get saved, we're positioned in Christ. We're the children of God. And then it says, and we're, in other words, sanctification means to set apart. Now we're being set apart positionally now to be used for God. But we also see not only positional, but we see practical. It says that she should abstain from fornication. This is our practice now as a Christian. We're no longer to live by our fleshly desires, but by the love of the Lord and the law of the Lord. And in verse four, it says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. OK, in sanctification and in honor. So Paul goes on to teach them on the, on the areas where they were struggling with their bodies. And he's saying this, he says, our vessels or the means by which we serve God. Now that you've been set apart for God's use, God expects for you now to use that vessel to honor and serve him, not for your own sexual pleasures or, or, or sensual desires. It says, and it goes on, it says, and in honor. Now look at verse five. It says, not in the lust of concupiscence. That means those things that are forbidden by God, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Now, when it goes and says here in verse four, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, you can look at this two ways. First of all, it's your own vessel that you indwell, that you should know how to carry out things in the life as far as how you live as a Christian in your own vessel. But it also could mean how when it comes to marriage, when it, when it comes to choosing a, a spouse. In other words, that you're to do it in a holy way. You do it to biblical way when it comes to finding a spouse for marriage. And in verse 5, it, it speaks of that. It says, not in the lust of, of, of concupiscence. In other words, it's, it's not to do it. You're not, you don't find a mate. In, in lust, okay, like you did in the old life, it says, even as the Gentiles which know not God. In other words, not like Hollywood does, you find a wife, but you do it the biblical way. In verse 6, it says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. And what that means is that word defraud means that there's a line that God has drawn the sand as we as Christians are not to cross that line. That when you, when you sit, picture a relationship between a, a young man and a, a young boy and a young a girl, that they are to look at that young lady as though she's either his sister or his mother. They are not to say anything that they would not say to their own sister or that they would not say to their own mother. And they're not to do anything that they would not do to their own sister or their own mother. In other words, she is going to be somebody else's wife one day. Oftentimes, young people will come to, to my office, and these are sixth and seventh graders, and they were caught kissing behind a portable building or some sort. And I'll, I'll ask him, and I'll ask the young lady, are you going to marry him? And of course, they're like, Whoa, what are you talking about here? No, I'm not going to marry him. Okay, then why are you kissing him? Do you know that one day that he's going to be somebody's husband and you're going to be somebody's wife? How would you like to go to that, to that, that one that you're going to marry and you have to tell them that you've kissed somebody else or you've done something with somebody else? Or if they ask you, hey, have you ever kissed somebody else or have you ever defrauded yourself with anyone else? And you're going to have to answer that. And if you don't, and I say, if you, if you tell them the truth, they're going to be a little hurt. But if you lie to them, you've got to deal with it in your conscience for the rest of your marriage. Amen? So we don't do things, the Bible says here, as the Gentiles do them. We do them according to the word of God. God has a plan for how we are to help our children in this area of marriage. It's not like what we see on TV. That is not, what, what Hollywood does is to make money. It's not for the sanctity of marriage. They have no respect for marriage. Everything we see on TV is tearing down marriage. All the TV shows, 
They're tearing down the home. There's a lack of respect of the children toward the parents. Watch these shows. You'll see for yourself. We don't see the sanctity of marriage here. We're not seeing children being trained up to leave home and to stay married. They're not being raised that way. School, public schools that some of our kids go to, they're having these uh, proms now as early as seventh grade. As early as seventh grade. 11 and 12-year-old kids are going dressed up on dates. Wow. He goes on and says here in verse 6, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. And he says the Lord is the avenger here. There's consequences for these types of things. But matter of fact, when you look at that word fornication in verse 3, it's the word pornea. That's all types of sexual sin. Amen? So it's all forbidden. And God says if you go and you, and you don't obey these things and you defraud your body and someone else's body, he said, there's consequences, and I will bring those consequences. You say, well, what might that be? Well, I can tell you this. 90% of females who are in mental institutions are having sex outside of marriage. 90%. I would say committing fornication has grave consequences for the emotional aspect of us because that's not God's plan. Our bodies are to be sanctified, set apart for God's use. Our, our vessels are to be holy. They're temples of God. They're the number one reason by which way that we can serve God. And when we commit sins against the body, it affects us in all types of areas, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We can't shake it. God knows that, and that's why he gave us these commands. And he says the only way that is to be honorable is inside the confounds of marriage. Anything outside marriage is forbidden. And when we come to that place in our Christian walk, in our own lives and even the lives of our children, then we'll get this. And in verse 7, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Amen? That's what God's called us to. That's why he saved us and set us aside to be used by him. Young people need to be able to get to know one another. The couple must avoid any situation which would cause them to compromise or be morally tempting. I don't think there's anything wrong. Matter of fact, I kind of joke about this in my office when I see young people come in there. I says, I'll even say this. I'm say, I'll, I'll turn to that young man and I'll say, I'm glad you like her and I'm glad she likes you because that, that shows that you're not homosexual. <laughs> amen? How many of you say amen to that? I'm glad they like the opposite sex. And I tell them there's nothing wrong with that. But you're not ready to go to the next step. Just like I wouldn't take a, a one-year-old child who just learned how to walk and put him on the street corner and say, cross the street, you're not ready to do these other things. And I'll explain to them why they feel the way they do and why God put those feelings there to prepare them later for marriage. They're going through a process right now. It's confusing. And I explain to them why it's confusing with the hormone changes and them not being a child anymore, not them not being an adult, but they're transitioning to becoming a, an adult so that they can get married and they can have children over here. Everybody understand that? That's what I'm teaching these young people. And that's what we got to understand. That's what we need to teach our children. And so we cannot put our, you know, it's going to come a time your kids get older and they're going to want to uh, be in a relationship with the opposite. But you got to understand something. Where are your children spiritually first? That's the question you should ask. Not should I allow them to see anyone, but where are they at spiritually? Do I see spiritual maturity in them? Do I see them making wise decisions? Are they trustworthy? Those kind of things. Do they know the will of God for their life? Do they have an idea of what they want to do with their lives? Those things need to be in place first. Amen? They really do. Because marriage is a big deal. And the Bible says he that findeth a wife, not findeth a date, findeth a wife. There's a purpose in it. And if there's a special someone, they need to be considering, is that somebody I might marriage? Not somebody I might try out on a test run. Amen? But is it somebody that's fit for marriage? And we men have to be fit for marriage. Our young boys have to be fit for marriage before they consider that other one. The young people should not be alone together. They must avoid immodest dress, conversation, and behavior. They should not touch one another. You say, well, is a handshake okay? Is holding hands okay? Again, I go back to the principle I gave you before. You shouldn't do anything with the opposite sex that you couldn't do with your sister or your mother. That just keeps it simple. I don't have to go any further than that, okay? And then the very next, let me just read one last verse that really brings us ahead. In 1 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul says this. He says, now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Well, that word touch here is a sensual type of touching. It doesn't mean that young men can't touch young ladies at all, but in a sensual way. 
Again, I'm not going to elaborate on that. Okay? I don't need to. We can use our common sense on that one. But that's what it's saying. Why? Touching leads to other things, and other things lead to other things. I'll keep it that simple. Amen? That's the reason why. So, again, when we have standards, standards are good. We don't worship standards. We don't want to be legalistic. But we do need to have some type of safeguards out there for our children because if we don't, you know, someone once said if, if, we, if we go, if we watch, somebody once said if we watch rated R movies, they'll watch rated X. Our children are going to always try to push to the next limit if we're not starting at a young age raising them a certain way. They're always going to do that because they're being bombarded by the world and the influence of the world. They really are. It's a challenge. It's a battle. And so it's very important we put those standards out there. But not only put those standards out there, remember standards don't make you more holy, they just keep you protected. Remember that. So just because a young person may have standards doesn't mean they're necessarily holy. They can be unholy in, internally in the things that they think and things that they do. But not, they may not take part in those activities, and that's just as damaging. But we need to have those safeguards out there to protect our children. We really do. Amen? Amen. And so as we close this morning and as we Look at this area of marriage in our own marriages as we model our marriage before our children and as we consider the marriages for our, our young people as well. May we as parents stand against the tide and what we see in our world today. Just like Paul preached in Thessalonica the problems towards the problems they had sexually in that day, we are no different today. We must take the same stand that he took, and that's the reason why God wrote this in the Bible, amen, so that we can take that same stand. Uh, for our children and fight for our children. Think about it. You don't want to raise your children your whole their whole entire young lives and then see them destroy their lives for the rest of their lives. That would be a, a, a dis disservice. That would be a miserable way to live and then die. I want to die like Abraham, knowing that my children married right and that they married someone who loved the Lord. That's really what all we're trying to do. I thank God that in our youth group, we haven't had anybody get, get pregnant you say, well, wow, what are you talking about? Well, there's a lot of youth groups where that happen. Believe it or not, there's a lot where young people get married. Where they, you know, and we have standards here. We have a standard that no boy can bring a girl in his car to church. Now, if parents let them do that outside of church, that's fine. You know, that's, that's, your, that's your business. But we don't want our young kids looking at older kids bringing someone of the opposite sex up in the driveway in their car. Because who are they looking up to? They're looking up to them. Amen? So we have standards here that we provide for our, for our church. Uh, if, if parents decide to let their daughter or son date someone and they're in our youth group, we still preach this truth. And if they allow that, we don't, we don't judge them, but we have, we have a standard. You're not going to be sitting together holding hands in church. It's not going to happen here. We have standards. Young kids are watching. You're not married, so don't walk around acting like you're married. You're not married. He's not paying your bills. He cannot provide for you. He doesn't even know what God wants him to do. How's he going to know what's good for you two? How do you know he's the right one if he doesn't know what God wants him to do? How do you know what God's calling you to do? I asked him them questions like, huh, what? Never thought of that. You see? So that's our jobs as parents. We don't have to do what the world does. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much. Lord, I know that uh, in this day and age we live, it seems so normal to see really children living as though they're married and acting as though they're married. We see relationships between young people where they're breaking up and crying and emotionally distraught at age 11 and 12 because they broke up with some boy or girl and their whole life is destroyed. Lord, that should not be happening in our society today, especially among the Christian folks. Lord, I pray that we as parents will have the fortitude to uh, teach our children and to, and to stand for what the Bible teaches. And Lord, we notice that the Bible does not give any specifics in the areas of dating or courtship, but it does give a whole lot of principles. And Lord, we don't want to be a church that dictates what people do, but we do want to be a church that preaches the truth. We do want to be a church that gives the biblical principles that should be applied in these areas and to our families. And Lord, I pray that we would take this information, Lord, and that we would put it to practice. That as we realize that we've been set aside positionally, we've also been set apart practically to do those things which you've commanded in your word. And Lord, I pray that you be with us this morning as our, uh, in our morning hour. Be with our pastor, fill with your spirit, Lord. I pray you speak to hearts. Help us now leave this place 
more in love with you than when we came. And Lord, I pray that we can make a difference, not only in the world, but in our, starting in our own homes first. That Lord, if there's anyone here that's kind of lost touch or lost control of some things at home, maybe between husband and wife, maybe between parents and children, Lord, I pray they get back to the devotion time with their family. They get back to the book and they would call a family meeting and just sit down with their children and sit down with each other if there's no children at home and begin to just renew some things, refresh some things uh, it, between themselves and their marriage and between them and their children and just get back to the basics of the word of God and, and serving and living for God. We thank you, Lord, so much for these truths. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Dismissed.